How's it going? And welcome to episode 99 of On The Wire, proud member of the Bitcherless Podcast Network. Follow the pod on the Twitter at On The Wire Pod. Of course, if you're listening on a platform that allows ratings and reviews, please take a second to let us know what you think. I am Adam Howe. You can follow me on the Twitter at 80 grade. That's all spelled out. I am once again joined by Kevin Hastings, who should be followed on the Twitter at Hastings Kevin. And we are less than a week away from PitchCon 20. 20- 23 kevin you saw the list it's been announced it's on pitcherlist.com you can go through and see everything that's coming out through the entire four-day event wednesday thursday friday saturday of course we are scheduled to be filming (laughs) streaming our 100th episode on saturday at noon eastern besides that obvious one is there any panel presentation or just day in general that you piqued your interest after uh, seeing the entire schedule all of them. Good I am answer. so looking right forward answer. to this. I, you, you know, it's great every year. I'm especially looking forward to it this year as it's become more of a regular thing that would, that we're looking forward to now. It's been fairly new for a couple of seasons. Now it's, it, it's nice. And yeah, I've been, I have a very flexible work schedule and I have been working a lot of extra days recently with the intent on, I'm not working for those four days. There That's going to be what I'm doing <laughs> is hanging out watching PitchCon and enjoying all of the panels, all of the presentations, our 100th episode. And it's just, I can't wait. What are we five days away now? Four days away? Yeah, but who knows by the time somebody's listening to this, it could be tomorrow. Who knows? But make sure you are logging in. You can go right to pitcherlist.com slash pitchcon. You can follow it on the Pitcherlist stream on Twitch as well. And the be- one of the best things about this year's event is and Nick announced, Nick Pollock, of course, announced that 100% of the proceeds are being donated to the ALS Association. In the past, we've done 50%. We still hit the $10,000 mark and everything else went toward running the show. We've gotten to a point where Nick felt really comfortable about, you know what? No, this year is 100% still the same $10,000 goal. And there've already been some early donations, which is amazing. Small donations, but they're still there. I expect that we'll expect to, you know what? I expect to hit the $10,000 mark during our live show on Saturday. I'm just going to oh, throw yeah, that that'd out be there. Cool. <laughs> but make sure you're checking that out and donating what you can. There's a whole bunch of prizes. You don't have to donate to get to the prizes, which is, which is great, but it does not hurt. And every penny definitely helps. One of the presentations that I'm looking forward to the most will be put on by our special guest today. And that is Ariel Cohen contributor to Rotoballer Fangraphs, of course, the co-host of the Beat the Shift podcast, which just celebrated their 100th episode recently with a very special guest and Vinny Pescantino. Congratulations uh, on on that get and a great interview there. Make sure you haven't, if you haven't checked out that, inter- that episode and every other episode, make sure you're subscribing there as well. And of course, Arlo has the is the creator of the ATC projections, which just came out earlier this week. And we'll be talking plenty about those throughout the episode. Before we get into all that, Arlo, thank you so much for joining us. And how are you doing? Hey, guys. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Yeah, I'm excited, too, to participate in PitchCon and to watch stuff. I'm interested in watching Michael Govier. Wait. That is some <laughs> hour. If you haven't seen his hour you have to watch that hour. That is the most riveting entertainment, and you just feel good after watching it. It's it, it, his energy level is on high for fifty five minutes. It's crazy. Yeah, it's between last year, probably my best, the best two hours of PitchCon were either between OBA's hour Power Hour of Baseball, which I think is the title of it this year as well, and the Justin Mason going through trip flicks. Oh, like, yeah. Yes. That was like also a really riveting hour of... Te- of Arizona, <laughs> child. <laughs> we'll never live that down. All right. We have a ton to talk about here. As we say, literally every week, Kevin, the news doesn't stop coming. So we're going to get into it right now. I'm going to start with your Royals. They found themselves a new closer, apparently in a role this Chapman. He finds a new home with your Kansas City Royals signing an incentive-filled deal, presumably to take over as the closer role. Reports that I read were that he turned down more money elsewhere with contending clubs because the Royals said that they would give him a chance to close from the start. How much trust should 
anyone else have in Chapman locking down the job and eclipsing Scott Barlow's 24 saves from last season? Yeah, the Royals only had 33 saves as a team last season. So 24 was nearly 75% of the team's saves. That wouldn't be the case for a lot of teams. But as the Kansas City Royals, they didn't have a lot of wins. We do expect more this season. I think everybody does. Now the number uh, more will vary on who you ask. But what's really intriguing to me was the fact that you mentioned that he turned down more money elsewhere. I believe it was the San Diego Padres. It's been reported, offered him more money. There was also interest. We don't know what the offer was or if an offer was even made, but there was interest from the Rays and the Dodgers. We has been reported. Now, David Lesky of Inside the Crown, he does crown, crowning jewels article. And ap- the day after the signing, This is a quote from his article. This is really intriguing to me. I did talk to someone who I trust who has very good intel into what the organization is doing. He says there is a fixable mechanical issue that they have found and believe they can fix. I think it's very easy to scoff at them for fixing someone's mechanics. But remember, this is a new big league team of pitching instructors. Nobody knows if they're capable of something like that though it sounds like they've got the right mix from what you hear around the game. So that's really intriguing to me. The Royals think they see a mechanical thing with Aroldis Chapman so that they can fix it and get him back to his old self, albeit a year or two older than we last saw him performing at an elite level. But when we hear these kinds of things, it's easy to poo them at the same time. It's something. There's something there, I believe, especially with contenders offering him more money. But the Royals did tell him he would be the closer. So I think at least to start and with a fairly long leash, we do have to trust this. And he'll be the guy to start the season and for quite a while, unless he completely bombs as he did in 2022. But for now, He's the guy in Kansas City. Brings up a lot of questions about, are they going to trade Scott Barlow? Are they just fortifying the bullpen? He's 24 saves is his career high, and he's been one of the best relievers in baseball statistically over the past three or four seasons. So he's used to this being used in high leverage situations earlier in the game. And maybe that's part of the thinking going into this. That's where he has excelled throughout his career and we have someone that we can count on in the ninth so we can use him earlier in the game i if anybody's getting traded in my opinion it'd be chapman this is a one-year deal from if i read that correctly i see this as trevor rosenthal 2.0 for the royals at least just hopefully he gets his act together enough where he built up some kind of value and maybe they trade him to san diego either way it's not like he got a no trade clause built into that into those incentives who knows we thought we talked about it a lot last year we thought the royals were going to make a lot of different trades and they really and, only spe- made and from the, the bullpen it didn't <laughs> yeah, happen exactly yeah. yeah they've done in the past last year was not that year Errol, when you are projecting saves, and I understand ATC aggregation and it's built on what other projections do, in your opinion, what's more important, a perceived role or at least a set role or perceived talent with the possibility of a role down the line? I it, In today's day and age, it really depends on the team. I you know the baseball HQ mantra is trust skills, not mm-hmm. roles, although when we were all trying to get saves, we were, our mantra was always... They got the role right now. It's theirs yeah. to lose. It really depends on the team. Tampa Bay, it's not skills, not roles. It's nobody's going to have the role. We're just spreading it out. Is Kansas City a team to do that? You guys, would, you're the Royals fan. You would know that better than me. I know the Mets are a team to say it's the role. It's the guy. Chapman is there for saves, and he signed, as you said, to get saves. He didn't want to sign elsewhere where he wouldn't be the closer. If he's not the closer, does he just walk out on the team like he walked out on the Yankees? I don't know. It's within the realm of possibilities. I call to you to your attention one statistic. His walk rate last year was 17.5%. I'm not sure Nick Pollock would have such a high walk rate in the, if he pitched. I don't know if that's going to hold all year long. Sure, he'll be the closer to start. How long will that last? I don't know. 
I don't know. Over under nine saves. What do you guys say? I say under. Man, oh, I'm I mean, going over. I think the job's his oh, okay. for at least two months, so I'd go over. Yeah, the I, Royals are going to be. I don't want to insult your team here, but I don't know if they're going to be any good. Are they? <laughs> they're going to be better than they were last year. Okay. Yeah. Um, and they had 33 saves on the season, so 11 in two months. And uh, yeah, I think he would have nine out of 11 if that's the case. I would venture to guess, based on the contract alone and then the reports we heard and all of that, again. He would have to really blow up in spring training, get hurt even, to not at least start it off. And he'd have to blow, I don't know how many, Kevin, probably four or five in a row <laughs> and to lose a job. Yeah. For, I was going to say three or gate. four. So, yeah, yeah, four. We're at four. <laughs> we'll, see where, we'll see where it takes it. Before the signing, ATC had six saves. I haven't run the numbers. It'll run again in the next couple of days. But I have to imagine that will go up a tad. Looks like on fan graphs. Most of the projections are holding at about three saves. Let's see the story. I don't know how much mathematically it will go up there. Oh, they're up to five now. They're there up to five. Go. Yeah, so you'll probably see ATC up at around eight or nine by uh, by the end of the weekend. Well, that that is that kind of answers my question though. It's like, what is more important, at least when it comes to projections, mm-hmm. is it role or skill? And it looks like, at least in this scenario, skill and production play a bigger role in projecting the saves category, specifically the saves category. We'll see if uh well, it's a mix of both. In ATC I use some manual projections, some automatic projections. I think it's a mix of both. With Chapman, to me it's role or not for him. If he has if he's in the role, he has it. And the question mm-hmm. is Will he keep it? So, and that's really you know. what's intriguing to me about him evidently being told he would be the closer when he signed. The Royals' new manager, Quattraro, come from Tampa, who you mentioned, they don't have yeah. anybody in that role. So yeah. this is going to be interesting to see how this plays out. And one of the things that we, there's some things that we ignore in spring training, but this is something I think we're going to have to pay attention to. And Eric, you do not update ATC throughout the season. When's the last like update you make? Is it like the day before the season? We're actually, it's in the plans this year. I can't tell you 100%, but it's in the plans this year to actually have ATC update throughout the year this year. So, oh, that's oh nice. Stay tuned on that. That's in the works. Looks like it'll happen. But uh, yeah, the last ATC preseason will be the day before opening day. Well, so I guess that's locked in. That clarifies the question I was going to ask about since you didn't update in season. What it would be interesting to see how many saves you have for any closer at the beginning of the beginning of the season, and if you're building in the fact that you think they're going to lose the job or not. But since you're going to be updating throughout the season, you can just update that as they actually yeah. lose their jobs. Saves are a very tough, pro, oh, yeah. very tough category to project. It's the least correlated the preseason projections with what happens. It's a crapshoot injuries happen, closers <laughs> lose their roles. It's really hard to project. We try our best, but as fantasy players that you just got to stay up to date on the news and you just got to be on the pulse to get the next in line before they're really Mm -hmm. up for it. Oh, uh, Barlow's now the closer. He's going to be 300 out of 1,000 fab next week. You need to be (laughs) able to get him in on your roster when he's $2 out of 1,000. That's really the trick to being a good fantasy manager. Absolutely. And even bad teams get plenty of save opportunities, as we've seen with Oakland, as we saw with Kansas City over 30 saves last year, as you mentioned, Kevin. So it's still a bullpen to keep an eye out for. All right, let's get away from bullpens. We have some news coming out of Toronto as they are following suit with Detroit and from Baltimore last year. And apparently also your Mets are changing some of their dimensions. Toronto is a little bit more than I think that we've seen out of the other ones. And if you look, if you compare... At least if you take away the height of the wall, they're bringing in every wall um, in such a way where they're actually going to have a smaller ballpark than Cincinnati's Great American Small Park. With every wall except for the right field corner, I think it's still going to be three feet further than Cincinnati's. With these changes, and we've seen changes happen in Baltimore specifically, most recently affecting the hitters, at least the hitters that like to go over left field. Do you think that these this is more affecting your view of the Toronto hitters or the Toronto pitchers. Don't tell Kevin Gaussman who, (laughs) yeah, Kevin Gaussman had a very, even though he did not have his most fantastic year last year, he still only had an eight and a half percent home run to fly ball rate, which was a lot lower than usual. The Rogers center has played like a pitcher's park in the past. I've heard conflict, conflicting points of view from people I trust 
in terms of whether it will go more towards hitters or towards not. I think it should produce more offense, especially the non-home runs, the doubles and stuff that'll go up. Whether home runs actually go up, I'm not sure because of the height of the wall. So that's up for debate. But yeah, it should play a little bit more towards the offense. And it should, it'll penalize both. It'll, right, it's going to penalize both the hitters and both the pitchers, and it'll help the hitters if it is an offensive park. I can't tell you how much it would be. I don't think people really know. I haven't heard this. I haven't heard the actual science of it yet. I'm still waiting to hear it. I'm going to say that it'll help a little bit, but I really don't know exactly how much, and we probably won't know for the, until we see the first couple of weeks of how it plays. Yeah, regardless of the height of that wall, that right center wall coming into 357 feet seems it's going to look pretty tempting to anybody that's looking in that direction. So, Kevin, are these new dimensions of the Rogers Center impacting anybody on your draft board? Again, moving pitchers down, moving hitters up, anybody in particular? A couple, I think. I like. Makes it's right center field is where they're really coming in, and we don't know the specifics on the height of the wall. It sounds like that's going to go up. But, yeah, a couple of these lefties that both pull the ball pretty well, Brandon Belt and Dalton Varsho. I think it helps both of these lefties in the home run department, maybe in batting average and OBP a little bit as well, because typically those are fly balls that would have been outs that now may be home runs. I like that a lot. There's been a couple of times that I haven't drafted Jose Barrios yet, However, I'm glad I haven't, and I probably won't even consider him going forward. With the home run problems he had last season and now putting this on top of it as a righty, I just don't see taking that chance with Jose Barrios any longer. I had considered it a couple times. I probably won't going forward. Yeah, even if that wall goes up in right center, like you mentioned it, batting average, OBP, I mean, that even if home runs don't go up for those hitters, being able to knock the ball off the top of the wall in for a hit or a double, or depending on how players actually play it as a Red Sox fan, playing off the monster is not an easy task for visiting for visiting fielders. And so you're going to have to get used to playing the field in a whole new way, regardless if you're on the Blue Jays or just one of the visiting right fielders. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays. Yeah. Without knowing the height, of course, we can't really run numbers without knowing all of the uh, X factors, but it will be interesting to see how that plays. And I will definitely be keeping an eye on my, I have at least one team that has a pretty heavy Blue Jay stack on it. So I will be looking fondly at that, hopefully come April. Yeah. I've seen a couple of tweets. It sounds like with these dimensions last season, Vlad Guerrero Jr. would have had three more home runs. I think it had Obachet with three more as well. A couple more uh, for, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Who, the leadoff hitter used to play for the Astros. Goodness gracious. Springer. But they, yeah, Springer. Why do I always draw a blank on somebody that good? Yeah, so a couple more for these guys. But yeah, I'm really looking at the lefties because it came in a lot in right center field, right? The power alley for left-handed pull hitters. And you made the point on Twitter, Adam. This, these dimensions are now smaller than Great American Small Park. Even not knowing the height of the wall, this is something that we're going to keep an eye on for sure. I mean, it would make sense to see these right-handed hitters hitting a couple more home runs as their opposite field balls. No matter how strong they are, they're still not going as far as their pull balls. So if they can get a couple extra or dozen feet <laughs> in yeah. their favor, yeah, they could clear the wall a couple more times. That makes sense. All right. We got a an actual trade. We alluded to the possibility of this on the last episode. And lo and behold, it did go through, Kevin. Miami gets their second baseman <laughs> on top of all of their other second basemen that they have on the roster. They trade for Luis Arise from Minnesota. And in return, the Twins are getting starter Pablo Lopez. And then a couple prospects, shortstop Jose Salas and prospect Byron Churio. What uh, what are we looking at as far as Lopez in, in Minnesota? As he probably, he's in the rotation. The, are we... Do you see him knocking anybody out of that rotation or are you not worried about just because of Lopez's and pretty much everybody in that rotation's injury history in the recent past? Yeah, I'm not worried about it a whole lot. He probably slides into the two or three spot. Roster Resource has him as the two behind Sonny Gray. I could see them running Joe Ryan out there ahead of him. They're going to get Tyler Molle back and they have Kenta Maeda. 
I think that probably is the correct five that roster resource has here that they would start the season with. They do have Chris Paddock sitting there. He had Tommy John in May. So we're probably wouldn't see him until the very end of the season. If we do see him at all. So I think this was a move that not the specific move, but a move in this direction is what Minnesota needed to make. And yeah, I think this is their five now to start the season and we'll see what happens with health and performance, but this is a pretty good spot for Pablo Lopez, I think, being the two or three guy for the Twins. It's like the Twins cannot sign a big free agent pitcher. They just can't do it. They can only trade for the guys they hope will become the big free agent pitcher. And they do it again with trading for Pablo Lopez. They trade away Luis Arias from their infield, freeing up some, some spots in Minnesota, but clogging up the infield in, in Miami. Ariel, what do you see happening in that infield. I know we saw that Jazz Chisholm is going to be moving to center field. And the quote I think Craig Mish put out there was that he was he told the front office that if they if Miami didn't acquire a center fielder, he would go out there and win a gold glove for them on a whim. Why not? I love his mentality there, but we'll see if that actually comes to fruition. How does the rest of the infield kind of iron out as they have a seven second baseman on the roster? I love Craig Mish. I would like to see him play center field for the Marlins, that would be really entertaining to watch. They also I think he was away. saying Jazz said he would play center field, but I also would like to see Craig Mish play center field <laughs> for the Marlins. <laughs> no, nah, I think it's funnier if, if Mish plays center field. <laughs> yeah, I guess Chisholm will be in center field. They also traded away Rojas, right, The in the, the offseason? <laughs> yeah, so apparently they were getting rid of infielders to get Arias, and I guess I guess Jazz will be in the outfield. What else are you going to do? You got Segura, who they acquired, who they'll move to third base. I guess Wendell is their shortstop. I guess Groshans will be there. Yeah, that's what they'll do. They'll have Arias there. Birdie will be the utility guy. He'll play all over the place. They'll move Jazz away, and that'll be his spot, and that's what they'll go. I also heard in the infield, though, that they might try drawing a blank again on the Houston. Yuli, uh, Yuli, Yuli Gurriel. Gurriel. Yeah. yeah, Yuli Gurriel. Yeah. So maybe they get him, and then Cooper ends up playing a little bit more outfield. Maybe something like that. But yeah, Arias will be the second baseman almost all the time right now. I think. Yeah, it seems they could have just held on to Lou and Diaz. I'm just saying, instead of having him play for or be on the roster of seven different teams this off season, I think he finally cleared waivers and is now in the Baltimore minor league system, so he's not going to be claimed anymore. So that's good for him. He's not jumping around. Yeah, it just it's just funny to see this roster and being like, you make the joke about how many second basemen they have, but it's more about the fact that they don't have a true shortstop. You mentioned prospect Jordan Groshen, who they got from Toronto in a trade last year. Birdie uh, will play a little bit. Yeah, Wendell will probably start off there. Uh, Segura used to be a shortstop, right? He used to be a shortstop, used to be a second baseman. Like you said, he'll probably yeah. be the third baseman now, which is also interesting. I'll be very intrigued as a baseball fan to watch the Miami infield kind of evolve throughout the course of the season. This probably also boosts some plate appearance. Obviously, it boosts some, but for a couple of guys that are interesting to people in Minnesota with Arias gone, because they they were had an overcrowded infield and outfield. This probably means Alex Kirillov is the everyday first baseman. If his wrist is healthy, or if we think it even think it's going to be healthy, then that's very intriguing. And for those of us that have been high on Nick Gordon, this probably solidifies playing time for him as well. Yeah, Nick Gordon, that's a very good, dare I say, sleeper. In these days, I don't like using the term because everybody knows everything. But yeah, that guy has... 2020 capability, let's say? With full-time. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the key. Kevin mentioned, if you give him the full-time opportunity, he was a fab darling at one point last season. We were talking about him for two or three weeks. Um, he's the brother of D. Gor- Strange Gordon, whatever he's calling himself these days. <laughs> yes. <laughs> D. Strange. I never ha- rostered him on a team while his name was Strange Gordon. I've only had him rostered while he was D. Gordon. So when all of a sudden I looked, I saw that come. I'm like, I do you remember see- when? Do you remember when Giancarlo Stanton was Mike Stanton? I do. Uh, sure are do. we too old? Are we old enough to remember that? I had me right. some Mike. Remember Stanton. when Aldemirto Mondesi was Raul Mondesi? So junior, junior. names change. Yes, junior. Got to get rid of the junior. All right, guys. We have a bunch of other news to talk about, but we're going to take a quick break first. 
All right, we're back. And we had a couple of kind of fourth outfielder type signings come up as well in Tommy fans signing with the Mets and then Tommy Lastella signing with Seattle and Adam Duvall signing a one-year deal with the Boston Red Sox. Ariel, do you see any of these being anything more than a fourth outfielder for their new teams? Not really. It depends on it. It's really injury related. If a guy goes down on the Red Sox, Duvall's a, Duvall's a good RBI machine. So sure, I can see an extended time for him. Probably play against lefties or, and whatnot. Same thing with Tommy Pham. Tommy Pham will play against lefties. He'll be a fourth outfielder. If Starling Marte gets hurt. He'll play. I think these are fourth outfielders. And just like anything in baseball, there's a lot of injuries. Fourth outfielders will get a, a, as much playing time. And if they're doing well, they'll, they'll roll. Kevin, of these three, do you have... Do any of them stand out as more appealing of a outfield streamer in shallower leagues than the others? Yeah, it's Duvall for me. Definitely going to keep an eye on. As of right now, he's their everyday center fielder, right? The way everything looks to me. And so when you're looking at projections here, and if you adjust what ATC has for playing time to what he did in 2021, the numbers are almost there, right? We're at 30 home runs, not quite, not 38, not 113 RBI, but over, you know, no 80. We're getting there. And the other thing interesting to me is his batting average dropped in 2022 and he was battling injuries. So if that comes back a little bit as well and he outperforms the projection and batting average, if we're looking at a 230 hitter with 30 home run, 80 RBI potential, I'm in. And I for the price that he's going for right now, he was I was in the middle of a draft champions league where he went fairly quickly right after the signing. So it's hard to know where he Love may have happens. went anyway. <laughs> but that was in the 27th round of a 15 team league. We're that that's late enough you can take a chance on anybody chances are he probably starts going a little earlier than that if people do believe he's going to play every day but at least for right now at the price it's definitely worth the shot you think Duval can handle center field all year i do i he's been he it doesn't it's one of those things until you look at his numbers and the only time his defensive numbers haven't looked great is when he's been injured. He's one of those guys. that's a much better fielder than we think. Hmm. Okay. We'll see how that looks in the outfield. I think this does it kind of, I think it pushes the possibility, maybe not the possibility, but it lessens the possibility of the Red Sox signing an actual shortstop and putting Enrique Hernandez at that shortstop position full time rather than signing Jose Iglesias or Elvis Andrews, who I think is the last decent option out there that Red Sox fans have been, quote, clamoring for, <laughs> if you can call it that. Is um, Duran going to get playing time, you think? I don't think he's going to the start. I think he has the. I think he's going back to Worcester to start the season and okay. kind of have to take the same route that Bobby Dahlbeck did for the Red Sox. We'll see if he can mash his way out of Worcester and get himself back into Fenway. But yeah, I don't think he opens. I don't think he opens on the opening day team unless he just has a massive string training and kind of forces their hand. Yeah, he's at that point and ATC's projections for a 672 OPS. That's right there in that range where. Jeff Zimmerman and Tanner Bell in the process and said, that's the point where you can lose your job. He doesn't have it. So he's going to have to way outperform that to gain a job, I, even more so than he would to keep a job if it was already his. So I think Duran's in big trouble unless he can way outperform the projections. To be fair to what Ariel's saying, like the Red Sox have a, had a history of having a bad hitting center fielder out there just to have the defense behind him and Jackie Brad Jr. They have that history of doing it. And if Duran can, I don't know. I'm not saying that they're going to do it again, but there's if they were going to do it again, they'd still have Jackie Bradley Jr. Yes. on the team. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> All right, let's get out of the outfield. Actually, maybe kind of get out of there. We'll stay with the Red Sox here, though. Kevin, Jorge Alfaro, he signs a minor league deal with Boston with an invitation to spring training and also a few opt-out clauses built in that he can activate if he's not on the major league roster come June. I think another one in July as well. Can he win a job out of spring training and produce enough to push him into the late C2 or catcher two discussion at the end of March drafts? 
I think so. I th- it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, I don't think Reese McGuire is going to prevent him from taking the job. Only himself will prevent him from taking the job. And they're probably the two guys. But we're probably looking at a 60-40 split here, like we see with a lot of teams. Right now, Roster Resource has Reese McGuire as the starter, as a lefty hitter. If this would become a straight platoon, Alfaro will lose out and then I won't have interest. But this is definitely something to keep an eye on in, in spring training and see how much time each of these guys is getting. I think he is at least the backup catcher, and th- there's a good chance he could win the job. Yeah, of course, they had Connor Wong out there as their backup at the end of last year. Got him over in the trade with the Dodgers for Mookie Betts. He does have an option to his name, and so he could very easily get sent down after spring training and not be too worried about that as well. So, yeah, I tend to agree that Alfaro will win a job on major on the major league squad out of spring training unless he completely implodes. He, the ability to play outfield can't be completely dismissed i'm not saying he will play a whole bunch of outfield for the red sox rl but does his ability to at least pretend to play outfield make him any more enticing as a c3 or a possible c2 even in the again in a draft champions where you're you're drafting at least three or four you're drafting three or four catchers maybe he'll compete with duval for that center field (laughs) there you go (laughs) (laughs) or it's gotta help yeah it can't hurt they invited him as a Non-roster invitee, minor league. They didn't give him a major league contract. You can't say that he's going to be the guy. I think that he's got a shot. There's a, there's a percentage chance where that's the end there, of his Red Sox tenure. There's a percentage chance he's on the roster. I do not think he's the starter. I think that it's McGuire. I think that he's number two. With He's going to be teaching McGuire along the way is what they would do if he makes the roster. But if they don't think he's cut out, then Wong is the backup and it's still McGuire. So... That's how I see it'll play out. It's depends what happens. There's a, one path to being a backup, and I think one path to being off the roster. I think the outfield is a very small path. Yeah, yeah, sure. I do wonder if that played any role whatsoever in the Red Sox signing him, knowing that that fifth and the same no. emergency outfielder situation that he could play. They have yeah. emergency yeah. outfielders there. It's, it's right? pretty much they, anybody. TK Hernandez can play. Right field, yep. <laughs> yeah. All right, we got a couple other infielders slash or corner infielders slash outfielders signing with new locations. Ariel with Trey Mancini signing with the Cubs and Brian Anderson signing with the Brewers, where Anderson could be slotting in as a starting third baseman for Milwaukee. Can e- each of them or either of them stay healthy long enough to reestablish their fantasy value in their new, more friendly, you know, hitter friendly ballparks? Yeah, I mean, Man- Mancini is definitely can be fine. Sure, he's been pretty productive. Last couple of years after coming back from cancer. Last year, he was worth almost one war. It sounds like that'll definitely play. A one war player plays on a team. So, yeah, that, that can definitely translate. There are a lot of people. You got Matt Mervis breathing down his neck. Matt Mervis, friend of the Beat the Shit podcast. You You're just on, on, on our show the other day. I feel so bad for the kid, by the way, Mervis. Oh, man. He, he, I mean, he could have been the first baseman this year, and then they signed Hosmer, and he's, uh-oh. And then they signed Mancini. Uh-oh. <laughs> And then you have to get you have to get to interview him on the show after all that already happened. No, they didn't didn't sign Mancini yet. Oh, they They, hadn't. Oh, yeah, it was like the day after. (laughs) So that was a little bit of an adventure. Yeah, Mancini should be fine. He's not gonna win your your league. Trying to see where I have in in ATC. He's about a two dollar player in a fifteen team league. He's going in the nineteenth round. Yeah, maybe he's somewhere around that value. Very. Late, although he qualifies in the outfield, so you would play him as your fifth outfielder if that would be the case. As in terms of Anderson, Anderson has a harder path to to being a little bit more valuable. He's got to actually win a job first. I don't know. He's going to be the regular in Milwaukee. They have Urias. They can play. They have Terang at second. They can play. So Urias, I don't know if he'll probably stay in the infield. Adamas is going to play. They've got plenty of first basemen. I, maybe they could play Anderson at first base. Oh, they got Telez. Anderson could get playing time in the outfield as well. Uh, I can see that. I, I think he's going to be a sort of shuffle play where you need be rather than a full starter. If I had to pick one of those two, Mancini is the guy. I think Anderson is just a filler right now. If there's injuries in the team and he's getting regular playing time, sure. But he's got a lot of work to do before I trust him. 
Yeah, I'd like to see what Mancini can do now that he's on a team that like presumably he chose to be on, that he has some time to adjust to Chicago. And as we heard, he had some adjustment issues moving over to Houston after being traded as a longtime Baltimore Oriole. So be interested to see how he does that. Kevin, who who should be in Ariel already touched on it a little bit, but who should be more upset about these additions? Those who are drafting Bryce Terang, assuming he would break the opening day roster as a starting second baseman. Now with Brett Anderson, maybe at third base, pushing Urias over to second base, that becomes like more of a question mark, even with the exit of Colton Wong and Asteri Ruiz, or those who have been drafting Matt Mervis since October after seeing him demolish baseballs in the minors. And of course, during the Arizona Fall League, and as you guys all saw at First Pitch Arizona. Yeah, I think at first, the my thought was, oh, wow. Yeah, the Mervis drafters are going to be more upset because the Cubs have come out and said he's starting at AAA now with these additions of Hosmer and Mancini. And Terang is probably still on the 26-man roster. So my first thought was, yeah, this is a bigger deal for those that have drafted Mervis. But when you dive into it a little more, I think... Brian Anderson, probably at least the short side platoon guy at third base, and then could play his way into more time. And the Cubs are paying Eric Hosmer the league minimum. If he goes out and doesn't perform and Mervis is tearing the cover off the ball, they have no problem outright releasing Eric Hosmer. So I think in the short term, Terang probably at least going into spring training and maybe to start the season, probably is still in the lineup, at least on the strong side of a platoon. However, I think it, if Mervis does what we thought he was going to do as we drafted him, those of us that have, then he's going to work his way back into the lineup. He's a better first baseman than Eric Hosmer. So I think... It's a hit, but if I drafted Mervis, I still have more hope than I did initially when the Cubs made these two signings. And I was like, what? Ariel said, and you feel bad for Mervis too, right? But I think the more that I've let it settle, I don't think it's going to slow Mervis down. If he's doing what he needs to do to play, they'll have no problem releasing Eric Hosmer. Let's also keep in mind, I think a lot of people talk about it's like, oh no, these teams want to have these prospects on the opening day roster so they can compete for the rookie of the year so they can get that extra draft pick. I don't know that either one of these guys would qualify for that as they have to be on what two out of the three of the quote major prospect rankings. I think it's Baseball America. I think it's the SI Sports Illustrated list. And then of course the MLB pipeline list. I don't know that either one of these guys are on two out of three of these. And yeah. so- they might not even qualify. So it might not even be something that they have, the teams have to consider for these guys being on the opening day roster. They're probably just going to do the service time manipulation. Right, exactly. Which, by the way, it's still, I know they changed some of the rules to make it a little bit better for the players, but it's still a thing. They can make them and come up, come, hey, Mervis, come up in two months, and now he gets an extra year on the team. They can still do that. It's yeah, still, you wait long uh, enough and get past the Super 2 deadline, too, so you have all that extra. Why control. else would they sign both Mervis and, and <laughs> both Mancini and Hosmer if they weren't going to try to manipulate it? Like, exactly. They, they He might be the first base in the future, and then this makes total sense. You're getting a league minimum guy, Hosmer, to fill in. Oh, well, we're just trying out Hosmer. Sounds like that's the plan. Now, I don't know, Ariel. Oh, this is the team that taught us this. I don't think the Cubs have ever this, done this before. Right? I don't think the Cubs have that's, ever done this. <laughs> this is the team that taught us this. Way before Vlad Jr., it was the Chris Bryant Brian treatment, rule. right? This yeah. is the team that did it. No, nah, they would never do it again. No, that's it. That it's got to be something with that. Uh, by the way, we got to get you out there to first pitch Arizona. because oh, <laughs> So, uh, I'm going to say two or three homers for Mervis over the weekend, right? He was Just fantastic. in one weekend. <laughs> yeah, all and stars. Moving walls in or out would not have mattered on his home run. <laughs> oh, no, he had some. And one of and the one in the four stars game was opposite field, right? Yes, yeah. I heard that. I heard yeah, he was, he was tremendous. And he's playing for Team Israel. They need all the help oh, they can so get. Good. Did you see that Dominican roster? Oh, Did I haven't you see seen that full, lineup? I haven't seen the full lineup yet, but I saw okay. as it was starting to trickle in, you're like, uh, no, this Dominican this roster, is, I'm going to say it's, it's, it looks better than what the AL All-Star team was going to look like. <laughs> it's incredible. It's incredible. 
We're talking Julio Rodriguez, Juan Soto. We got Machado, Jose Ramirez. And Jose Ramirez is not even it. playing third, right? Ramirez. No, he's playing second base. Yeah. They got Classe in the bullpen. They got Al- Al- Alcantara. Just it is a tremendous team. They, to me, they should win it all. I'm pretty sure Yahoo has already given Jose Ramirez second base eligibility based on that roster. It's yeah. something to keep a lookout for. Yeah. All right. Oh, man. I haven't been. I went to a World Baseball Classic game back in 2013 when they had the finals in San Francisco. And man, if anybody out there is listening, you have an opportunity to go to any of the games. It, they are an absolute blast. Make sure you have a chance to experience that. Obviously, it only happens every once every four years. So get a chance and make sure you're following that and get to a game if you can. All right, Kevin, last news thing on the docket here. Not a signing, not a trade, just somebody's going to miss some time. Frankie Montas, he's expected to miss the first month of the season due to shoulder inflammation. Who would you be expecting to get the majority of the starts from the fifth spot in that rotation? And can that individual do enough to either hold on to it or just to be fantasy relevant even after Montas comes back? Yeah, I think I've heard a couple of ways people are going here. And I think a few more are leaning towards Domingo Herman, But I'm much more intrigued by the Clark Schmidt crowd. And this is what I would like to see. And he's being drafted late enough where you can make this move. And if it doesn't work out, you're fine. And it could be in the bullpen anyway and give us value there. But I think I'm leaning Clark Schmidt for fantasy. Just a lot to do with the cost and what could happen. And he could still be valuable if he's not in the starting rotation. And that's the route I'm going. But it's probably pretty much a toss-up as which way the Yankees will go. Yeah, of course, Schmidt still has that option. Russell Reese has him starting in the minors. I don't think a lot of us expect, especially with this news, that he would start in the minors. He would, even if he doesn't get that fifth spot. I haven't looked at the Yankees roster schedule either. They might not even need a fifth starter like for a little while as well. So whoever does take that spot, and I'm also more interested in Schmidt, but I my money would be that once they need a fifth starter, that Herman would be the one that they give the ball to, at least to start here. But Ariel, how how much faith or trust would you be putting into Frankie Montas after he returns, assuming he returns after a month? We don't know. This is the same shoulder, I think, that was bothering him last season as well. And so for it to come up and him to already be announcing that he'll be missing the first month of the season, which presumably means he'll also be missing spring training, he'll have to ramp up as well in either expending string training or in rehab games after the fact, how much stock would you be putting into him even for the amount of the season he will be pitching? Yeah, that's not a good sign when a pitcher says, I'm definitely not going to be ready for the first month of the season. And we know, of course, that he'll definitely come back exactly one month, right? Exactly. (laughs) That's how it works. Yeah. Shoulder is not a good sign. There's always nowadays, you know, the epidemic with Tommy John, but Shoulder used to be, shoulder is very tough. That's very tricky. That stays, that doesn't get better. It's, that's very tricky. My, my podcast mate, the Reuven guy, he sees any of these shoulders. He's like, Ugh. Yeah. He lost his, a lot of his strikeouts last year. He was pitching before then. He was pitching K per nine of 11 or whatever. It, it's about, about, went down to about nine last year. And on the Yankees, I don't know. These trades, some of these trades at the end of the year don't work out. Sonny Gray trade didn't work out. Montas is not working out. I don't know. It's a little risky. If you're playing in a league that has an injured list, you can take a a late gamble on him if you like. He still should be productive. He still should get you enough strikeouts. And Yankees will win games, so he should be okay if he, if he's healthy. Again, it's a risk. If you don't have an IL, if you're in like an NFBC format or you're very limited IL, you may not want to take him, and then you'd be surprised when he's out half the year. If you have an IL, you can take a dollar or two gamble on him is the best you can do. Better off taking him in general in shallow leagues because you can always drop him. But yeah, it, I would expect him to be out for at least a month and another month until he really ramps up into being as somewhat productive as to what he could be. Yeah, I have absolutely no idea if there's any association. But of course, if everybody forgets, Frankie Montas got dinged for the PEDs at one point in his career. And I wonder if just being off of him is trickled down to now. 
We're seeing the he same He came issue. back in 2021 in a good year, He though, did. Right? He had 187 innings there. It's the only time he, he had 144 in a third last season. So we'll give him that credit, but that's still 40 and so odd innings down from what he had the year prior between two teams. We'll, I wonder if we'll ever see anything close to the 187 from him again. And maybe way too soon to say that he's entering his age 30 year. season. So he's still got, hopefully for his sake, he's got a couple more years left to go, but we'll see how that works out. Yeah, he's he's off my board right now as well. I agree. If you got an IL stint, sure, why not? There's worse ways you can use one of your last picks in a league like that as a stash because it's not taking up a roster spot and you can always pick up somebody in the week one. But if you got no IL spots, I'm not not looking at stashing Frankie Montas. Or any Just pitch. hypothetically, how would you guys feel if Frankie Montas was the best pitcher you had on a dynasty staff? Mm-hmm. Just hypothetically, hypothetically there's yeah. no reason I'm You're asking for a friend. Yeah. <laughs> no, for your friend. Not uh, great. Get, yeah, it depends on your time frame uh, of when you want to win. If it's this year, <laughs> yikes. If, there, uh, but, if uh, he was your best pitcher going into this offseason and you wanted to win this year, I was already going to feel not that great for you. <laughs> but regardless of your situation, probably uh, not well. Maybe so. Craig Mish can pitch for the Yankees. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Bring it full circle. Well done. All right. That is all. That's all we got for news today. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some stuff come out as you're listening to this. We are going to talk with Ariel Cohen about these ATC projections in just a bit. But of course, we've got to take another quick break first. All right, we are back. You are still listening to On The Wire. I am Adam Howe, joined by Kevin Hastings, and we are lucky to be joined by Ariel Cohen, the creator of the ATC projection system that debuted just a few days ago across various platforms. Of course, Fangraphs is the most common one, I think, that people look at. Ariel, where else do you throw the ATC projections onto that people can find it? They're on Rotoballer, and they're also on CBS Sportsline. It's a nice Google Sheet that you can download for from CBS. So check that out if you're able to. But they're not are they the, they're not the projections that are in like the draft room. If you're drafting on CBS and they show expected stats, are those the projections that they use? So that's a whole other discussion I have with CBS. Oh. <laughs> no, they are not. There is somebody else that does that. Yes. It's not going to be this year. Let's just say that it's possible that the following year will get them to change their minds and Use ATC, but we're there not there. We're right. not there yet. Despite, Working on it. We'll cross yeah, that despite, bridge when it's built. <laughs> despite me, me trying. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'm always interested. It's like the rankings always come out. The projections always come out on the different sites as they open up. It's kind of weird though for me. Like I'm hopeful there's a day that you're going to be able to go on at some drafting software. And oh, there you go, the projections. But then I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Imagine me trying to draft against anybody Yourself. on there. <laughs> oh, it's just my rankings are exactly whatever the rankings are in the system. <laughs> I was just going to say, I personally, I wish every site and most of them are, but I wish every single one of them, that their default rankings were all screwed up the way most of them are. Leave them that way. Oh yeah. It helps people like us. The ESPN rankings just came out and of course all the tweets started already. Yeah. I wish those rankings were everywhere. They changed their whole game, ESPN. You heard about that? I think I heard. Now it's going to be like Yahoo almost. I haven't. They changed their, uh, yeah, their roster settings where they only have three outfielders and yeah, yeah, yeah. Very minimal. We should put those rankings on NFBC. Yeah. (laughs) The thing is the NFBC rankings will change in their draft rooms over the course of time. You ever ever play on ESPN? By the way, you ever play on ESPN and there's somebody in the room that's on auto draft and they (laughs) just feel so catchers. The catchers. (laughs) So I used to play, actually, <laughs> Ruben's brother was in a league. He was a doctor, this guy. And uh, he likes to play the Stars and Scrubs. So he buys like four stars, spends $50, $60 on them, and then goes to sleep. And then ESPN keep, keeps getting all the catchers. <laughs> so any smart guys in the room keep putting up anybody catchers, for a dollar. Bid. Yeah, doll- and they keep bidding. He ends up with seven catchers on his roster. That's great. Oh, man. <laughs> well, you don't fall asleep in a draft. <laughs> yeah. And when it's your software doesn't, team. yeah, if your software doesn't have things in place that make it so that you don't pick the same position over and over again, you end up with seven kickers on a football team. You end up with whatever. Can't use them. That's, I love it when they do, though, because that team is out of the running. <laughs> that's it for that team. <laughs> got their stars, though. They got those stars. The stupidest thing was I offered him a trade for a catcher for somebody else. Like, no. No. <laughs> <You got seven laughs> what are you doing? 
<laughs> just drop them all. Just drop them all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Your ATC projections aren't in the CBS draft room yet, but they are in a bunch of other places. People can find them, obviously, as you just mentioned. And you know what? If anybody doesn't know what the ATC pro- projections are, I'm not going to make you hash that out. You were on the show last year. You pretty much did all that. It's an aggregate system of a bunch of different or a few different projection systems that you look over every year. My only question is, do you ever take a, do you ever take one out and put a new one in over time based on the results that you're seeing out of that projection? Or have you been using the same groupings for the last five or 10 years? Oh, all the time. All okay. their stuff goes in and out as they gain weight or as they lose weight. If they start losing enough weight, then they're out. And I always try, I always analyze different systems if I can to see whether they have any merit. But yeah, that's sure. That definitely, is. there's a couple of systems I used to use way, way back that they stopped publishing. I don't know, they were taken by a major league team or whatever. They were good projections, or at least they were good for a certain cohort, and uh, they're gone. Everyone else has to fill in the gap. So that happens all the time. It's a good question. It's interesting to know that at least it's flexible in that way, and it's literally just math. It's just based on actual results, and that's why I think a lot of people really gravitate toward the AT percent. ATC projections. It's why you're the last one out. It's at least of the major ones that we've gotten used to over the last couple of years. By Um, definition, it has to be. Exactly. (laughs) Sure. So let's just get to the topic that I know has been brought up quite a bit. And I want to get your take on this, at least verbally here. The rule changes, it doesn't seem as though every or any projection system has really made adjustments based on the bigger bases, the pitch clock, the shift rules, all that yet. But How would you be personally basing the weight that you put on the aggregation on each projection that's going into it based on what you are told by the projector, how they're taking those into account? Yeah, I had an article on Rotobuller about Mm -hmm. this, what they're going to do. Basically, the big projections that you probably use, they have not yet done it. They will. I am told that somewhere in the next two to three weeks, they should have something in there. And they're going to tackle what they can tackle. Zips, I know, d- will not. Dan Zimborski, he basically has the opinion of, I don't know how that's going to affect it. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. And we'll find out next year, and then we'll see if we can put it in. But some of the other, all the other projections will attempt in a certain way. It really depends on the change. A lot of people are saying, oh, how are you going to change the new balance schedule? Right, the, the everyone's going to play everybody. That's already going to be baked into every system. Most people don't realize it. The schedule changes every year, right? Sometimes teams play all the AL West. The NL team play the AL West. And the next year they play the NL Central. Sure. The AL Central. That's been going on for a while. And there's different parks involved in the AL West and AL East. And it's just a matter of changing your park factors that you use for your average player on your team. So that's been going on. So there's no change necessary. It's already baked in projections the pitch clock and the pickoff rules that is not really going to affect so many people projection wise pitch clock probably not at all because most people are going to be fine with it there might be a couple slow pitchers but it's hard to know if, if all right they'll have to speed up a few seconds but it's hard to know if they'll actually be adversely affected or not i don't know the pickoff rules could be a little bit more in terms of stolen bases because essentially you're only going to be able to pick off once, right? Because if you pick off once, if you pick off, if you try to pick off twice, then you're not allowed to throw over a third time or you are, but that's going to be the last one. If you throw over three, done. So it's an automatic base. So you're pretty much only going to be able to throw over once. So that could affect stolen bases as you'll get a bigger lead on the second try. Mm-hmm. That is not going to be addressed by projections directly. They're not going to be tackling it is what I'm told. But the larger bases slightly, or I should say all of these elements are going to be tackled in total maybe, but I we don't expect it to be a large effect on the pitchers at all. You will see some changes on the hitters. It won't be to all the player pool. It's not going to be to the highest players who already are stealing bases. It's not going to be to the players at the bottom who are slow as heck and they're not going to steal. But you're going to see some bump up for the ones in the middle. What's going to really be changing is opportunity time. If you think about it, a stolen base is the product of how good you are at stealing when you steal and how often you steal. So the how good you are will increase a little bit because of the bases and the how often you steal will probably be a little bit more depending upon what the opportunities are from all this. So Those tweaks will go in in terms of the hitters. You'll see that. And in terms of banning the shift, that is going to affect 
a small number of hitters a lot because those lefty hitters that are have the shift against, that have terrible averages against, that's going to change. You're going to see that, and projectors will use minor league data, minor league baseball data to do it. For most of the hitters, though, there actually won't be much change. Righty hitters, you probably won't see much at all. Even some lefty hitters, if there's no discernible difference, either way, you're not going to see it. The effect won't be as great as you think, but projections will tackle it, and they'll be pretty good at making an initial guess. And that will, that's not in yet. That'll come in the next two, three weeks. So if I'm going to be drafting, I don't do any drafts right now in January, February, so it doesn't matter. So ATC right now, is just going to incorporate whatever the projections are. I'm not changing weights. I'm doing everything in the same way, same percentages. I'm not going to say, I know Zips is not changing, so the heck with them. I'm actually not going to be doing that. Zips is going to get whatever weight it was supposed to be, but that's because that's their theory. Again, I'm, my theory is that Zips is getting its same weight. The other projections will do a little bit of a tweak. If I know, one caveat, if I notice for some select players, and I can tell, a discernible difference in what they produced until now, the projections produced until now to then. And okay, across the board, these couple of projections are now 10% up on a certain player. I might actually go in and modify zips and to throw the 10% in based on that. I might do a couple of manual modifications if I can absolutely detect what the process is for certain players. So that's part of my artistry of the projections, but largely I'll leave it up to what the projections come up with. Yeah, you probably saw my hand raising. I'm just, I had a very specific question. You answered it without me even having to open my go. mouth, and I appreciate that. Yeah, it's interesting that you're not going to change your weights. And that was one of my questions. Like, how are you going to adjust your weights on these projections based on what they tell you they've done? And I won't say what they're going to do because we don't know until they actually say I have it. in the past, though. I okay. have in the past. I've talked to the projections guys, and if I say, oh, something like something, I'll change it up or down. But for this, I've decided not to do that other than going back for certain select players and applying the logic from one on to the other. I've done that kind of adjustment before, so I know how to do it. Fair enough. We had this question, Kevin, I'm going to pose this to you too, because you use the projections, you use various projections. You talk about it a lot throughout the course of the, of the off season. You know, how much, especially now with all the rule changes, how should, how much should we be trusting or how much trust should we be putting into the projections with all these variables? And this question came up a lot out, going into 2021, of course, after having to wait the 2020, the results of the 2020 season so differently based on the shortened season, especially when we hear people say whether they're saying it right or wrong, these projections are, quote, right more often than they are wrong. You know, wh wh where do you stand on that as far as how much trust you think we should be putting in to both ATC and the bad and zips and whoever? I think personally, for me, it's going to be more important to trust projections now than it ever has been before. Because when we have these changes going on, we think we know how it's going to affect things. And that's where the biases come from. And that's the whole point of projections. Ariel talks about it. Derek Cardi talks about it all the time. The whole point is taking our human biases out of the equation. And with so many changes, we all have opinions on all of this. And this, I think it makes it more important than ever to at least use them as a baseline. And then, as we always say, have a very good reason for making any adjustments you're going to make. Yeah, we talk about all the adjustments and not double tapping and what have you as well. We had this, I think we had this question come from our Discord and Ari, I want to pose it towards you here. And I'm just going to go ahead and read it straight up so I'm going to make sure I don't butcher the question. But we tell people to be careful when cherry picking and adjusting projections on their own as it's easy to double tap certain criteria. You the guy is going to hit more RBIs because the the lineup around him will get him on base more or keep in mind the projections probably already accounted for the probable lineup construction. But if one wanted to make manual adjustments to projection systems, download the ATC projections and or wherever else and adjust certain stats as they see fit, what factors could they account for that are currently impossible to actually include in projections, in your opinion? Yeah, so you have to... Yeah, well, if you're using projections, you have to understand what projections do well and what they don't do well. Projections are good at looking back at the past and seeing what has transpired 
and saying, okay, based on the history, this is what it's going to be. So things like regression are done very well with projections. A guy had an outsized lucky year. You're you can't that's why if you see a guy all of a sudden he hit two eighty after he's been a two sixty hitter, you might say, Oh, look, he's found it. But it could be just regression. So projections will do that. When you find something that have not been in the past that projections couldn't account for. That's the only time you can really make it. So in terms of the rate skills, if there's a pitch mix, and I say this now, if there's a pitch mix difference and the guy is going to be adding a new cutter, he's going to be adding a new this or whatever, that could be a reason to do it. Oh, he's working on a new swing. He's There's something, some soft information that you know, and where you, it's not going to be in projections. And by the way, pitch mix changes that's currently not in projections now. That will be. Everything has been component. Do you guys remember the days when projections didn't even include velocity? Anything, velocity? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, of course, they've shown that it's a significant factor. Every projection system or every decent projection system includes velocity. Pitch change mix is pitch mix change is that's going to be included. Right, because that's very big. Statcast data, that's going to be included, right? W- right, wherever you know that the projections aren't including it, that could be a factor. But the most important thing is playing time. If you know a playing time situation, if you know a health concern about a guy, they're interested in bringing up a prospect, whatever the situation is, if you have better information than you think that the projections do, that would be the right place to move things. Very often, if I, I see Jacob deGrom is projected for 190 innings, or Kershaw is projected, Ker- a better example, Kershaw. Kershaw is projected for 175 innings. He is not having 175 innings. If that's what your mechanical projection system put up there and you're drafting to that, you will say Kershaw is going to be the fifth best pitcher in baseball or whatever, and we'd love him. He's not going to pitch that many innings. That's something the projections don't see very well. We know that the Dodgers are going to sit him. He's going to have his back hurt. So anytime you have playing time information, 100% you should change it. That's definitely what you need to do. Let me, this is something I bring up with a lot of people and most people tell me they don't pay attention to it that much. But what about the personnel on the team, like coaching tendencies, whether a coach likes to hit and run more, whether they like to steal bases more, it, the personnel, like the history of at least the manager being taken into account in the past, or is it all on the players? Yeah. Projection systems generally, just to say generally don't, there could be projection systems that do. It's not out of the realm that we talked about st- stolen bases are opportunity time success rate. Opportunity is a lot of manager decision as how much he's going to give the green light. Yes. When I look to get stolen bases, I look to pick players from teams that th- they let the players run. Jake McCarthy on the Diamondbacks is going to get the green light more often. They're going to they're going to fail to score a lot of runs. They're going to let him go and manufacture runs. Whereas the Mets, why would you want to steal a base if you have Pete Alonso right after you? It really depends on who's a vi- who's what team the construct that sometimes projections get right, sometimes it doesn't. It's hard to know because don't like some projections are black box, but yes, manager discretion should be involved in terms of it if you're smart and if you can detect that projections aren't doing it correct, then there's an edge for you. Yeah, I mean, we, I think yeah. we say we talk about it all the time with closure situations. It's like certain teams have certain tendencies. We talked about it earlier on the show. So it's something that has to be taken into account. Yeah, Adam, you were you brought this up a few months ago, early in the off season with a couple of teams and above and beyond. Yeah, obviously we're going to take a look at tendencies that they've had as far as bullpen usage, as far as stolen bases. Those are two obvious things. But I think when you brought it up early in the off season, you were talking more along the lines of a new pitching coaching staff and how is that going to help the rotation as a whole and those type of things. So I asked Derek Cardi about this in Arizona and he said that it's, he can't quantify it. So he can't put it in the projections. If he could come up with a way to quantify it, he would. So he thinks it's important enough to include in the projections if there was a way to do it, which leads me to believe if you really believe in a new coaching staff for a team that maybe you could give players a slight bump and vice versa, it's not included in the projections, but I wouldn't, I'd be careful about doing it too much. I think it was Jeff Zimmerman that brought up recently. Typically those types of things are more on a personal level. The staff isn't going to help 
everybody. It's going to be they connect with a single pitcher better than someone has connected with them before. So there is something there. And like I said, Derek said he would include it if there was a way he could quantify it, which means it's probably important enough to take into consideration, but not too much. Yeah, I mean, if you try to adjust, I don't know, 300 players, you take ATC projections and adjust 300 players, okay? Do you think that on the whole you're going to get that 300 right or <laughs> you're better off just doing nothing, right? I'm sure there's going to be some players that you're going to be right on, but I bet you dollars to donuts there's going to be more players that you're wrong on and an overall you're going to be wrong, right? It's very hard to beat the projections when projections are really about aggregation and about getting cohorts of players correctly. If you're going to make adjustments, do it few and far between. Do it when you think it counts or do it for specific players that it makes a difference. Adjusting people at the top like Juan Soto ain't going to do anything for you. <laughs> but if there's some value of doing a couple players or significant playing time, that's something else. Just don't do it to that all, all that often. And by the way, if you are able to beat the system most of the time, please call me and we'll do some good investments in go. gambling and you know. <laughs> other things. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, Kevin, you guys just touched on this already, but are you putting any extra weight on personal rankings or human made rankings and projections over pr aggregated projection systems like ATC, the Batting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just because of the new rules and the variables that are going forward? Or do you think more people are going to be putting more weight on those just because of the unknown? I think people are, and I think it's a mistake, and that's why I'm not going to. I think, like I said, I think it's more important a season like this with a lot of changes going on to not pretend we know something we don't. One great example already, I think, if you look at Corey Seager's projections, right, across the board between 271 and 278 batting average after hitting 245 last season, and most people just looking at that would say, of course, that's because the shift is gone. Well, that hasn't even been taken into account yet. This is just normal regression. He's hit over 300 every other year of his career, right? This is normal regression bringing that back up. And it, when they do add the shift, it may adjust a little bit more. But that's just an example of I think most people would tell you that he's projected for 278 because the shift is gone. When yeah. in most of these cases, it doesn't have anything to do with it. Yeah. I'll tell you, back in 2019, so Fantasy Pros has, if you go on there, a lot of experts submit their rankings. Oh, this guy is, here's their, here's their rankings for all players, and people submit, and there's 200 or 300 experts, whatever it is, on Fantasy Pros. I don't do rankings. I don't submit rankings or publish rankings anywhere. I put projections, and what I did, what I do is I just calculate what my rankings are based on ATC, and I submit it to Fantasy Pros. 2019, I was the number one ranker beating anybody who did any manual work. All I literally did was take ATC projections, run an auction calculator, and here you go, here's one, two, three, four, five, six, here you go, and that was number one. So I now I don't expect to be number one every year. Last year I was number six or whatever it is. I'm going to do pretty well more, than, more often right. than not. Anybody who's changing things way up projections, it's not going to help you in the long run. It just won't. It shows you that if, a, if ATC was able to be number one in a year, it means you really should not be adjusting projections at all. ATC, ATC should never be number one. It's an aggregate. It's an, a, it's an average. How can it be number one? But it is because people are just adjusting too much. I think that's, that brings up a good point. I was told one time that if, if you're drafting from projections, those are 50th percentile, so you should expect to finish mid-pack. My response was, no. that's only if every single player in the league is using those same projections. Then that would be the case. But most people don't. We have egos. We think we're smarter than what the numbers tell us. And that's why I think that you can still rely on projections. And yes, we're going to have the minor adjustments, maybe major ones like Ariel brought up. If you're adjusting Juan Soto, that's not going to be a big deal. He's still a first round player. You may drop him to the second round if your adjustments are negative. That's not a huge deal. It's the guys that are later and it's typically going to be playing time. And once in a while, there's going to be a breakout that you saw coming for some reason that didn't see it. So you're high on a guy. Spencer Strider last year was that guy, right? A lot. We talked to Russell, armchair Roto, 
He was all over Spencer Strider last season, even in DCs before the season started. That's a great move, paid off handsomely for him. But in general, it's just going to get you in trouble. Yeah, that's probably the safer way to go. And that kind of leads me into this last little synopsis I'm hoping you can give, Ariel. You tweeted after the after you put out the projections, you also tweeted out a couple of, I think it was like a 13 thread tweet on with a, I think it was only 13, might have been more. There were a couple of basically graphs using ADP from NFBC where you color coded based on a couple of terms that I wanted you to gonna give a synopsis for to save people the trouble of reading your tweets <laughs> and or kind of learn learning it more on their own and also just for my own sanity as well. You talk about interprojection standard deviation, skewness, and then intra projection standard deviation, and then also process versus parameter risk. Can you kind of elaborate on those a little bit? I think you're going to be touching on these during your PitchCon presentation. So feel free to get into as, as little or as a lot <laughs> as you'd like to hear. And then everybody can make sure they tune into PitchCon to hear more about this. Yeah, come to PitchCon. We're doing an hour on this stuff, which is hopefully riveting. Yeah, no, but just a, but before we talk about the statistics, process versus parameter risk. So when you have a baseball player, let's say his name is Freddie Freeman. Freddie Freeman has a true talent, right? If everything goes right, if he was able to play a million games this year with this, his age and his ability, on average, he would hit, let's say, this is going to be 30 homers. That's his true talent. Process risk is because there's 162 games and because maybe he gets hurt a little bit or maybe because there was a rain out here or the game was, took longer, went to extra innings, he might have a few more homers, a few less homers. Right, so some years maybe he'll hit 34, some years he'll hit 30, 26, but on average he'll hit 30 homers because that's his true talent. That fluctuation of what he could possibly hit in 162 games is called process risk. What parameter risk is, how the heck do I know it's 30 homers, right? What is his actual true talent? What is that average value? How do I know it's 30? That's the uncertainty around the average parameter, the expected true talent is called the parameter risk. Now, when he, the nice thing about ATC, because ATC looks at multiple projection systems, is that every single projection system has its own measure, has its own output of what the true talent is. Maybe some projections had it 29, some projections at 34, some whatever it is. And ATC, of course, is the average of the true talents. But sometimes the underlying projections are going to be really close to each other. Well, they all think it's about 30, 31, 30, 31. But sometimes they're all over the place, 20, 30, 40, who knows. The bigger, the wider a spread of projections about the ATC mean is a higher interprojectional standard deviation. So the inter S the inter SD, interprojectional standard deviation, is a measure of how wide projections are distributed about, about the mean. But there's also the, also the question is, how are they distributed? Is it just as much up and down around the mean? Are there more projections up and there's only one outlier low? Is it the opposite? Skewness, interprojectional skewness gives you a flavor. A negative skewness means that there's some outlier low, but most projections are above what the average is. And a positive skew would be if there's an outlier above and most projections are below, zero skewness would be they're evenly distributed. So the interprojectional figures give you a little bit of flavor on how the projections are distributed that go into ATC. And what I've observed is that the higher the standard deviation, the higher the spread, the more uncertain a player's the more uncertain the, a player's true value is, according to the projections, the lower that they'll actually be expected to do. Meaning that 30 homer total is probably going to be a little bit less because of the uncertainty. If they were more together and everyone said 30, 30, 30, we'd actually see a little bit of a rise, maybe 31. It'd be a little bit more certain and maybe a little bit more positive in the expected value. Skewness is if there's a negative skewness, if there's one outlier low, but most of the people are, are up above that's like a good sign that oh maybe that outlier was wrong and we've seen actually players do more Aaron Judge was a good example last year he had a huge negative skew so he was projected pretty much regularly about the mean but there was some projection that went low outside that if you removed it his projection of ATC would have gone up that was a nice signal to me that whoa 
Aaron Judge is probably better than what the projections say. Boost him up a bit, and of course that was correct. Of course, I picked you. I picked the best example, Aaron Judge. That's that. The other statistic you talk about is the intra projection standard deviation. That's a measure of dimension. So when we say that a player is one dimensional, oh, Mond is the only steals. That means he his most of his value is in one category. If he were to fail, get injured, underperform, you'd be hurting in that one category quite a bit. Whereas players who are more spread out, a guy like JT Real Muto, Seiya Suzuki, who has its value distributed on all five categories, if they underperform in one, maybe they overperform in another, they still will hold on to their value longer because they're distributed. They're going to have a low intraprojectional standard, intraprojectional. Intra means between itself, projectional standard deviation. So I found, of course, that in terms of holding value, you are better off having players who are spread out. It's not really hard to know. <laughs> Everybody understands that, but this actually quantifies it. So ATC quantifies the parameter risk of the true talent and the dimension of a player. It's fantastic that you get this flavor with the course of ATC and the process, and it actually helps you with risk categories. When I draft and I have a value, I adjust it based on some of these parameters, and I can be pushed higher or lower based on their risk parameters, and it's just closer to what the actual value is at the end of the season. Yeah, we talk about draft, we talk about in the drafts all the time, like how much risk did you put early in your draft? You probably want to take a little less risk later in your draft and vice versa. Maybe you have a little bit more ability to take on that risk later on in your draft and to know what the standard deviation of that interprojection, as you're mentioning it, and you're going to say it a lot smarter than I'm going to say it, it is good to know like how much risk did I actually take on? You can actually quantify it mentioned, at least based on By the, the way, ATC. Was that understandable? The way I put it, there's a lot of math in there, right? I a took lot. very, I, there was a lot of math, but I took some, some quick notes as you're saying it. And I just, there was like low skew equals good. I think that was pretty much what yeah, my takeaway yeah. was that from that. We'll have more <laughs> colors. And so what I've done, what I've done that I posted on Twitter is I've drawn a map of the players in terms of the NFBC, right? I could have done it in terms of ATC values, but the NFBC, here's what people are drafting. Here's the first round, the second round. People are understandable. Oh, Turner is first and Judge is the top five, that kind of thing. And I've highlighted if it's green, it means it's very low risk. And red, it's very high risk. So you can very visually see who the players to watch out for. Tatis is like bright red. Jacob deGrom is red. It looks like somebody is, is can't breathe there. And so you can see it really bubbles up really quickly visually of who to look out for and who to say, aha, that guy's safer than I thought. Not so, even on an individual basis. It's nice to be able to see like where is the risk being taken throughout yeah, the yeah. draft is it second round is it fifth round is it 20th round where where's more risk being taken so make sure you're checking out atc and why one of the one of the shorter handles on twitter which congratulations on having that out there i'm like i don't think they allow five character handles anymore <laughs> it for me <laughs> yeah congratulations uh, all right we got a couple let's dive into very quickly a couple players that i think stood out to me when i was glancing over the atc projections as they were coming out in comparison to what we're seeing out of the adp coming out of nfbc at least draft champions look at draft champions pretty standardly just in the last month or so and when i'm looking at that i'm gonna i'm gonna give you guys a list of players to consider i mean there's two sets here there's the first set we're going to talk about. These are players that are going much earlier in NFBC drafts and champ, you know, draft champions drafts than ATC would consider them, at least based on a very simple auction calculator calculation. And we have two pitchers to start off with. My question is, for all these players, really, how much would you push the player up your draft board to ensure you got them to keep to keep value if they're going if they're going below their ATC value. And in this first set, it's more, how much do you believe in the projection to actually push them down to where they should be going? Or are you still going to be going after these players for whatever reason instead? So Kevin, let's start off with these two pitchers for you. We have Kyle Wright. ATC ranks him as the 122nd pitcher value-wise. 
where ADP, he's going as the 51st pitcher. Of course, these are pitchers. Oh, that's huge. That's, that's a huge. pretty big, That's the, this is the biggest jump of pretty much anybody on this list. Of course, this includes relievers and starters as NFBC doesn't indicate the difference between the two. Also, those actually calculators are a lot easier just to come put those pitchers together as well. And then Dylan Cease, he is a hot topic, of course, as he had as he was last year and he is this year as well. He is going as the 11th pitcher off the board in the ADP sample that I looked up and the ATC had some ranked at 34. So are either one of these guys, do you like them so much that you're ignoring these projections and taking them either at or right around ADP or how far would you allow them to get pushed down before you felt like there was too much of a value that you had to grab them? No, I think both of these guys, it's pretty easy to see. So when I see a big difference like this i click on the player page and if you look at atc projections for kyle wright everything is right in line with what he's done in the past you could we talk about projections are doing it manually what these projections come out to with everything except one category is probably about what you would write down right he's got him for five less innings K per nine, almost exactly the same. Walks per nine, almost exactly the same, right? Home runs per nine, almost exactly the same. All three of those regress slightly, but not a lot, not much at all from what he did last season, right? All of that is about what he did last year, except we're never going to project someone to spike 21 wins. And 13 wins in a projection is a high number. That's a great projection for wins from a player. We're not going to see anybody above 14 or 15. We got him at 13, and that knocks him all the way this far down. That was a pretty nice wake-up call for me when all of the projection steamer, first one to come out earlier in in the year, noticing that because in the Arizona draft, I took Kyle Wright about where he's being drafted in ADP right now. You would think, oh, then that's a pretty good spot. It turns out it's not. I won't have Kyle Wright on any more of my teams. I already thought this about Dylan Cease. And once again, you look at the projections and there's, like I said, I is there anything here that looks egregious? Is there something that I want to go investigate and see what the projections are missing? No. Everything except we're not going to project somebody for a 2.20 ERA. And I haven't looked this up, but I know this is a fact because I watch a lot of White Sox games, whether they're playing the Royals or not. Dylan Cease gave up a lot of runs that were not considered earned runs. That 2.20 ERA last season was extremely lucky. Probably would have been higher than the 3.53 he's projected for this season, which is really the only difference in what he did last season compared to these projections that knock him down that far. So I was already off of cease, but I don't think that there's anything here that I'm noticing that would want me to go against projections for either one of these guys. Yeah. All right. When you look at when you look at this, you, Kevin, you really outlined a lot of. You look at the projections about what are you seeing anything egregious or whatnot. But all right, why are like what is it about at least these two players? Because these are two of the largest, two of the largest jumps in, in difference between the ATC ranks ADP that we're seeing. And these ADPs aren't new. Like these are pretty. These have been pretty steady since early October drafts. What is it about these guys? Is it just the 21, like the shiny 21 win total that we're seeing on the, what they did last year or Dylan C's coming in top three of Cy Young voting and all the hype that he has. Is it all hype or is there something else that you think drafters are seeing that aren't being calculated into the projections? General answer is that when you see players being drafted this high after a good year, it's called recency bias. That, oh, this guy just did it, so he obviously can do it again. But, of course, they're ignoring the very, very powerful regression that takes hold of not everybody, but most people. So the general answer is that they're not going to be this good. Of course, they could, in a specific case, they could be, and you'd have to really analyze the player. But in general, it's going to be more wrong than right. Now, you said at the top of this question, 
do you should you push a player up to to go to ADP or I don't push I don't believe in pushing anybody who draft how you want to draft the ADP is a menu of prices oh to buy Kyle Wright you're going to have to pay about this price I either agree with it or I don't say I got to change my mind on a player because he's cost that much I don't do that in general here's my take on ADP in general uh, I don't look at ADP for the first couple of rounds. I draft who the best players are. I don't look at ADP at the end of the drafts. I draft who the players are, the best players are, the upside players. The only place I look at ADP is in the middle, and I only do it to say, okay, this guy who I want to I take right now who is the best player, but is he going way earlier and I can get him cheaper and get somebody else now? and increase the value of my team. The only reason I use ADP, it's just a menu of prices. I don't look at it to tell me what I should do or not. So in the specific cases of Kyle Wright and Dylan Cease, I'll say Cease first. Dylan Cease, 2-2 ERA last year. His FIP was 3.1. His XFIP was 3.5. By the way, anytime you get a big difference between FIP to XFIP, it's because of the home run rate. When you have an XFIP worse than FIP, the only difference is that it's the homers. FIP just looks at what you've given up in homers. XFIP says, you know, assume a league, look at your fly balls and assume a league average rate. He was being lucky. So he was actually being lucky with the homers compared to league average last year. Sierra, 3.48. Dylan Cease, I mean, it's just regression here. He had a very lucky BABIP of 260. His strand rate was 82%. That means he was stranding quite a lot of people on base. The average is somewhere in the mid low 70s. So he was lucky. This is recency bias. What is correct is the strikeouts. His swing strike rate has been 15%. It's been two years in a row. This is definitely a player who it's recency bias. He, I agree with ATC's take a lot more. It's general no. Kyle Wright, though, I, ha- I have to say, though, that he has made a discernible change from last year. His walk rate plummeted from 14 to 7%. His strike rate, strikeout rate looks... Maybe a tad lucky, but pretty much within the realm of what could be. Babbitt was eh, maybe a tad lucky. Strand rate a tad lucky, 79%. But in general, it was looks like he had a skill. It mostly was the walks. To me, it's a guy that you really need to pay attention to in spring training. If you The walk rates and strikeout rates tend to stabilize fairly quickly, even in spring training. If you see his strikeout rates and walk rates come back to where it was last year, I'd actually say that the ATC projection is low. I don't know if I would go all the way up to where the market's pricing, but ATC projections will be low. If you see that he's walking, guys, it means you can ignore last year and the ATC projections fairly right. So the, I think the jury's more out on Kyle Wright, and the Braves are a good team, so he should win a fair number of games next year. But the jury is still out on him for me. Cease is, is a pass at market value totally. Ariel, the ATC has Kyle Wright projected for 7.7% walk rate when last year's vastly improved number was 7.2%. So they're letting him maintain almost all of that is already incorporated into the projections. Yeah, the uh, that's true. The whip, though, is uh, ATC projecting 128, where his whip was 116. It's a combination of walks, and str- of walks and hits. But yeah, you're right that most of his goodness has already been taken into account in ATC. So yeah, it's not like I'm going to go straight up to what where the market's going to be. But yes, you're right. A lot of that is taken into account. I like the most of his goodness is now the title of this episode. All right. <laughs> I like it. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to lump these two guys together just because they're on the younger side. It's what kind of keeps them alike. We have Riley green. He's the outfielder in this group. He's being ranked as the 81st outfielder by 80 ATC, whereas he's being drafted as the 45th outfielder in drafts. And then on the catcher side, Logan Ohapi, he's ranked as the 27th catcher by ATC, but still being drafted as the 19th catcher off the board. Kevin, is this just like people being interested or overly interested in youth? Even though Riley Green obviously already made his debut last year, Arnie Hoppy was also made his debut a little less tenure than Riley Green. But is this just, is this outfield and catcher depth perception or is it these guys are young and they still have room to grow? How do you think drafters are looking at these guys compared to what ATC is saying? 
Yeah, I think all of that is a factor. I think the big thing with Riley Green, as far as ATC projections go specifically, is plate appearances. The other projections that are listed alongside ATC on Fangraphs all have a lot more plate appearances, at least 80 more plate appearances, and they go up to as much as 110 more plate appearances than ATC has, which leads me to believe that there are several projection systems that have him quite a bit lower than the 504 plate appearances that that ATC has him. So that's definitely something that we're to pay attention to in the Springs, or if we have strong opinions one way or another on what that playing time will be. Ariel's brought it up. We talk about it all the time. The one thing that I am most likely to adjust and keep everything the same on a per plate appearance or per inning basis for hitters and pitchers is adjusting the playing time. And the same can be said about Ohop here or Hoppy, I believe is the actually the way we're supposed to say it or the way it's actually pronounced. <laughs> That's why we're supposed to say it that way. Uh, he's lower in plate appearances than the other projections on fan graphs. So I think that is a big part in what's bringing his spot down in the auction calculator as well. So both in both cases, it's something try to figure out. Do we have a reason that we have belief in more or less playing time and make those adjustments. And we may not be able to do that until we get into the spring and even into the season a little bit. Ohape for sure is one of these guys that you may draft him as a catcher too. And you'll know two weeks into the season, oops, and you drop him and you pick up another catcher. Yeah, just a word on the playing time. It does look like Riley Green's playing time projects a little bit low. The next iteration of ATC, you'll see his plate appearances will go up. So that was a little bit low for a projection reason, but you'll see a little bit of a difference. Not all the way, but you'll see a little bit of a difference next time ATC is updated. But yeah, I also see a little bit of difference in run production. Look, he hasn't done it yet, Riley Green. He, He hit what? five homers in in 300 something at bats last year. So he hasn't done it. And I guess one of the projections I use maybe takes a little bit more of what last year's values possibly. And okay, here's what, uh, here's what's gone wrong for him, but maybe pedigree and other, uh, other projections are taking more minors work from what on fan graph that could be. Yeah. I tend not to think that he uh, 45th outfielder. I don't know. I don't see him as a number three outfielder, Riley Green. I can't see myself picking that right now. I could be wrong, but I wouldn't bank on somebody who's never done that to go that high in an outfielder. In terms of a hoppy, he's actually a guy I talked about on my catcher podcast last week with Vlad Sedler. I like him this year. I think that the playing time that ATC has is wrong. I think that it's going to be a lot more. It's not a formulaic error. It's I think that Max Stassi is not going to block him. I think that he, Stassi, he had 215 last year, I think. He, he's just not going to block a hoppy. I think a hoppy is the guy who's going to gain a lot of playing time. Just Sean Murphy gained playing time last year. You're going to see a hoppy gain more and his value will go up. So I'm actually more to the market than I am to ATC projections on a hoppy. I, not that I don't trust ATC there, but I actually agree that the playing time looks low for what I think he's going to do. So. I agree with you on him. Yeah, and I think situations like, especially with Ohapi, it'll be interesting to see how ATC adjusts in season, as you mentioned, that'll be the case in 2023, as it shows that he's getting four games out of seven, and and then it goes up to five games out of seven in a week based on production. All right, the last two I'll bun together. These are our middle infielder and corner infielders of the group, guys who've been in the league for quite some time, so it's not a youth thing. We have Jorge Mateo. ATC ranks him as the 69th middle infielder, and then (laughs) the 38th middle infielder going off the board. These are, of course, all players that are eligible either at second base or shortstop and any other combination of any other positions as well. So there's a lot of players involved in these in this grouping of numbered rankings that may not be playing middle infield, but they're still eligible. And then Eugenio Suarez, ATC ranks as the 37th corner available. And then, eight, but he's going as the 22nd. So not a huge gap with Suarez, but Mate- I think though for Suarez, I don't think that's right. I think the market actually has him closer to about the 34th best corner infielder. I think he's actually going much lower. 
So I think there's less of a gap than, than, than I'm not sure we got 20 second, but I think the market's actually lower on him. All right. I well, could I'll, be wrong. I could look that up, but either way, let's talk about Mateo then. What is it about Kevin? What is it about Mateo? Is it just the idea that you can get that speed that we saw out of him last year in the playing time and they're hoping for that? Or is there something else there that we're missing and we should be ignoring the projections and going after the, at, at, going after him at the ADP market? No, once again, it's playing time. And I noticed this a couple of days ago, actually. It's not just ATC. Everybody is projecting Jorge Mateo for between 320, 350 plate appearances after having 533 last season. Everything is in line with what he did last year. If you actually projecting him for a better batting average than the 221. He's just not going to have 13 home runs if he only gets half or 60% of the plate appearances. And the stolen bases are, ATC is actually high on him in stolen bases with 21. But if he gets 533 plate appearances, it's right back to double digit home runs and 30 plus stolen bases across the board in projections. This is all about playing time 100%. If you think he's going to be an everyday player for Baltimore or get traded and play every day, you should be looking more at his 2022 numbers because they're all lines right up with pro rating his projections that every system right now has him for much less playing time. All right, and double checking this. All right, yeah, I've got Eugenio Suarez. Did I get it wrong? At 23rd. No, you're right. I was wrong, but it's 23rd instead of 22nd. If oh, Now, wow. filtering out just draft <laughs> champions drafts since December 1st. So if I, we always say on this show and on Twitter, and I, talk, I yell it from my rooftops, whenever anybody out there is listening is looking at ADP, please make sure that you are filtering your data on the NFBC site. There are a lot of different types of drafts that are going on the site, whether it be gladiators, if you're looking in that time frame, or best balls or cut lines or what have you. And people draft, obviously players are worth different amounts based on the format in which you are drafting in. And not to say that's the case here. I'm it's just a, literally a weekly warning to everybody listening once again. I guess I did it wrong there. I thought when I did it, I thought I, I took both Draft Champions and Gladiator and combined them. Maybe I did it wrong. You never know. But if it is, then that's a huge that's a huge difference to ATC then. Uh, yeah, I, and I wonder if this has anything to do with the perception of third base being a, a hole, a black hole of talent, or at least one that has multiple cliffs early on in the drafts. How do you look at that, Ariel, as far as when you are comparing dollar figures in an auction calculator and in building that into your uh, as you're looking to draft at certain positions? Yeah. And by the way, I agree with Kevin on the uh, Mateo. It's just playing time. Gunnar Henderson should be the guy. Mateo was a lot of shortstop last year. He's playing time. He's not that good a player in real life. So it's one of these instances where the heck with his value in fantasy, he's got to be good in real life to get playing time. So I agree with you on that. But as far as deepness, it's not about the top. It's not about the middle. It's about the replacement level value for a lot of these things. Because technically, if you wanted to, and it really depends on format, but if you wanted to wait and get a third baseman with your last pick or a dollar pick, you'll get him. So it really matters who's at the bottom and especially leagues that have utility players th there's enough third baseman that you're not gonna it's not like catcher where you would never pick a certain guy unless they would if not for the position that you have to fill it's not true in third baseman at all there's really no difference between a third baseman a first baseman and second baseman in terms of replacement level so you don't have to push up values now you may decide that it's easier to find x on the waiver wire it's easier to find a third baseman versus first baseman versus whatever but in terms of pushing up auction values when i calculate stuff i don't adjust third baseman versus the other because i find that the player pool is really the same is it easier to find the first baseman than third baseman? Yes. So by that definition, maybe if you want to look at replacement level two or three down, okay, I can see a, a little bit of an extra push for third baseman, but not all that much. I'm not obliged to, oh, I got to pick Jose Ramirez 
early because he's third baseman or Machado. I'm, if I think that Freeman is worth a dollar or two more than Machado, I'll pick Freeman in general, unless I think that I can easily get some first baseman down there. It's more about the player pool. It's not just about how deep or, or not anything is at, at the top or in the middle. I like that you brought up the fact that it's all about the replacement level that you can get off the wire, whether you're in 12 team or 15 team or doesn't matter. It's who's going to be out there. We can talk about how deep shortstop is. We hear about it on every podcast that preview shortstop, right? How deep it is, how deep catcher is now, even especially in a one catcher league. But you know what? There's still a cliff at some point between the rostered, ca- the rostered shortstops and who you're going to be able to find on the wire. So I like that you brought that up, especially with, The position of third base that we keep hearing about how the talent level is not as plentiful, but the fact is the difference between the third baseman that you're going to draft in, say, the 12th or 15th round may not be that much of a difference between the guy you could pick up in week two off the wire. The only thing that I say is that if you're in the middle of a draft and you have to decide between a third baseman and shortstop, at a certain point, third base... I'm not going to say goals off a cliff, but there's a big drop between the Riley, Devers, Arenado to all the way down to the others, Bohm, Henderson, whatever it is. But shortstop has a lot more players. So if you're really deciding between the two, you ha- you should be able to make the argument that if I don't pick this third baseman now to get the comparable third baseman, I have to wait a while. But for the shortstops, I don't. I can actually get a fungible one for the next five rounds. So if you look at the replacement level at that particular point, you're better off taking the third baseman because at that level, it drops down. But it doesn't have to be at that level. It could be somewhere in the middle for a different position, right? It's always when it's your turn in the draft. So it's actually more important to know the whole shape of where the players are, and that'll tell you where you have to make your choices in the middle. It's it's not an overall third baseman is deep. It's where it is because at the first round, you might say, oh, I can get Austin Riley next round. I don't need to get the whole zero mirrors, right? There can be an argument for I can get somebody else at a certain point, but you just have to see where you are in the particular draft as you're drafting. Sure. All right, I'm going to I'm going to bunch I'm going to go to the next section where these are the guys that are going much later in the draft compared to where ATC thinks they should going based on value at their position. I'm going to bunch all the hitters together and I want you guys to let me know of those of these four, which one do you think you would jump more to get closer to that ATC value to make sure that you would get them. And this is relative because there's one guy in here that's only three 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 players dif- difference in rankings and there's others that are 19 20 points difference so we have in the outfield Masataka Yoshida left fielder for the Red Sox of course ranked by ATC to be the 40th outfielder but he's going current still currently going at the 59th outfielder off the board in drafts even after the signing with the Red Sox then at catcher, Salvador Perez, ranked as the number two catcher by ATC, still going as the fifth catcher off the board in drafts. Alec Baum, a little bit further down, as, ranks as the 21st corner, corner infielder by ATC, but going as the 31st corner off the board in drafts. And Brandon Rogers of the Rockies, ATC ranks him as the 35th middle infielder, BP of the 50th middle infielder going off the board. So Kevin, of these four hitters, again, relative as a percentage wise, if you will, which one are you more more likely to jump up closer to the ATC projection to make sure you got him rather than waiting until you can get more value, obviously, if you wait until you get to that ADP. But if you really want to make sure you get this guy, how far are you willing to push them up? This is where the, if we're looking at NFBC ADP and checking it out, this is where clicking on the player is very valuable. And we'll see with Yoshida, he's going recently quite a bit higher than his ADP. More around that 200 range than 238, which is what he's at over the past month or so since mid-December. And then actually looking at his page as well, he's ranked that much better than ADP by ATC. And ATC is the low on playing time for him at 121 games. If if he hits like we hope he can, and here's the, the other thing that's really intriguing to me, AC has him projected for a 127 WRC+. plus. That's the low as well. 
If he has a 127 WRTC plus, he's playing more than 121 games, in my opinion. So if we're bumping this and we're looking at 140 games or so, if he is their quasi everyday leadoff hitter and maybe they sit him against lefties once in a while, then we're looking at what I heard Tim McLeod say, pushing 20 home runs, great OBP, all the projections have him for that. But he moves up even more. So taking into account that he's already being drafted higher than ADP reflects, and I think that he can actually get more playing time than he's projected for, Yoshida is the guy that I'm definitely most interested in due to these projections. I'll go with a different guy, but just to comment on that, Yoshida is a perfect guy that will make ATC look good either way. Because if he doesn't, <laughs> if he doesn't work out, oh, you were low on him. Oh, I was <laughs> you were low the low on guy. him compared to the other projections. But if he does work out, I'm still far ahead of the ADP. There you go. <laughs> I win, win either win. way, right? Right. There you go. But of course, that's also the strength of ATC is that. When you're the average of projections, some on fan graph, some on not, and you show a strong signal, it's usually a good reason to buy. And you're usually right. And it doesn't really if you matter if you're right a lot or a little, you're right. You buy a player at the market value. You don't buy him at your ATC value. You buy him at the market value, right? You don't have to push him up. You buy him at market. And then you realize the same upside. Whether it, last year, if you would have said Aaron Judge would hit 50 homers, or 60 homers, it didn't matter if what you're projecting, you're going to buy him, right? So it doesn't matter. But anyways, the guy I like is Bohm here. I cannot, I cannot see him. I can, I actually see what he did last year as he can go up from that. And if he does what he did last year, he's going to beat this projection this year. The power is absolutely real from Bohm. He actually steals some. He's got a very good contact rate. I believe his average will be high. I see no reason why you're getting a discount. on a. And the, look at that lineup. Bohm is easily completely underpriced if this stays true and oh, i guess people are listening to this podcast but it's a good <laughs> i'm gonna buy that value if that stays the same that's a good that's a very good value the answer is boom here there that that's a great point though whether you believe it or not we've talked to other people who do rankings and all that and they have influence atc specifically especially since it's the last of the the most popular projection systems to come out will absolutely impact ADP from here until yeah. March. It, yeah. we, these ADPs that I'm spinning out right now obviously are based on December and early January drafts. Maybe I should project like crappy wrong values to see what happens. You you should, just to see what happens. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, At the maybe, last maybe, possible second, you turn on maybe the right one. Maybe, no, maybe one year I'll say, you know what? Let's just end this. And then I'll publish terrible values. <laughs> then I'll go in and play the main event and I'll swoop in and win the whole thing. And, gotcha. No, I'm, I would never do that. That's your retirement yeah. season. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I'm joking. I would never do that. But uh, yes, this seems like a market inefficiency currently. All right. And then I got three pitchers here and I lumped two of them together just because they are more of the injury risk or qu injury questionable players. And that's uh, Clayton Kershaw and Chris Sale. But on top of that, I've got Carlos Rodon on here. Rodon ha is ranked by ATC as the number fourth four pitcher overall ADP has him going as the 17th pitcher off the board. And then we have Kershaw who is ranked by ATC as the 31st going at the 55th pitcher off the board. And Chris sale is ranked 42nd, but he's going as the 70th pitcher off the board. Kevin is there is the risk basically of these, at least Kershaw and sale baked into this ADP too much that we should be trusting the projections a little bit more and bumping them up? Or are these situations that are, again, I don't know what the, the skew is on these guys, Ariel, whatnot, but I'm wondering, Kevin, okay. are you worried about the injury risk of these two guys more so than you are the projection? I haven't made my mind up yet on Chris Sale, but Clayton Kershaw is, this is a guy I was talking about a couple of weeks ago when I said we're going overboard and looking at playing time, right? It, he's projected for 125 innings by ATC. If that's all he throws, no more, no less, throws 125 innings and he's in your lineup every single week, regardless of of whether he's on the IL for one of his Dodgers, let's manage his load thing, which is going to happen, which is a good thing for Clayton Kershaw 
It keeps him out there when they want him out there. It gets us to those 125 innings. He's ranked higher than Dylan Cease, leaving him in your lineup every single week with almost 60 less innings pitched. This is what I was talking about. We're putting too much into this. That's the whole reason he's being drafted where he is. And people probably assume he's getting about 120, 125 innings. But because of that innings, they're dropping him so far. And this is exactly what I was talking about. Love Clayton Kershaw at this price. Like I said, I haven't made my mind up on Chris Sale yet. I haven't dove in to the projections and ADP him on him nearly as much. Carlos Rodon isn't going to stay here. If you're in a draft right now, this is the time to grab him. If you haven't already, I think he's going to start leapfrogging people because a lot of people are talking about this, not just us on this show. His name is coming up in a lot of places as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, but I think at first people were thinking about going to Yankee stadium and the short porch lefties don't touch Carlos Rodon. It's not going to matter. He's going to start leapfrogging people. And then when we see pitching move up in general, as draft season goes on, he's going to move up anymore. I don't know if he'll get to the number four starting pitcher off the board. In fact, he probably won't, but he is going to move up. So now is the time to grab him if you want him. Yeah. I I know I lumped Kershaw and Chris Hale together in the injury concern, but Rodon, obviously people have that concern about him as well. He squashed a little bit of that from his production last year and the volume that he put up. It's is a pitcher is always injury prone, regardless of what his history is. If you have any kind of history, I think people are always going to consider it at least. And I think that probably plays a little bit into why he's going as currently the 17th pitcher off the board. And I agree with you, Kevin. I think that that's not going to last as well. Ariel, do you have any other takes on these three guys? And would you be drafting all three of these kind of guys in your drafts just based on the risk factor alone? I'm happy taking Radon. Radon actually has very low inter SD, very negative inter SK. There's really, there's no risk in performance with him. I think it's literally only health risk. And the strikeouts are great, and the whip is great, and he's going to have more wins conceivably with the Yankees. I don't think there's anything wrong with Radon other than can he stay healthy? And I don't know that there's any more risk with him than other guys. So I like him. Kershaw has average interprojectional standard deviation, but high skew. So there are outliers. The outliers are positive, so he's probably worse than this. But again, it's a bet on the health. Last year, ATC projected 125 innings. I think he ended up with 126, so we were spot on there. It sounds about right, and that number of innings could be lower. Again, you have to realize that the innings are front-loaded, that you'll see more innings in the first half with him, I think. If you're in a trading league, he's a much better pick. Just trade him after a month and get the same value, and uh, and you can actually get that. Sale is more iffy. I know what Kershaw does this every year. Sale is a little bit iffy with back from injuries, back from fluke injuries. Don't know as much. In terms of his ATC risk characteristics, he's got high interprojectional standard deviation because people are more uncertain, but it's actually negatively skewed. If any, there's an outlier low. That sounds about right in terms of what I would expect from him. Very different, but there's probably more some yuts that, that, that goes low. I think he has the ability. He looked good for the six innings or whatever he pitched last year. It looked like he was getting into it. It's about whether I think he's with health. I, I don't know that I can trust his health all year. Projections right now are 130, ATC has 133 innings, I believe. I don't know. It could even be low. Who knows? Am I willing to take a gamble on him? I think for the right price. I think I would want a little bit of a more of a discount here. He's going in the 12th round, which is really decent. I think it really depends on the rest of my roster. If I have some stable starters before, I'll take him as an addition for a bright spot. Probably wouldn't count on him as a top starter, though. So it really depends on the construct of your team, whether I'll include him, whether I want to include his aggregate risk with everything else. If I have a very risky team, I'll probably not. If I don't have a lot of risky team at that kind of 13th round price, I might take a share or two. Yeah, I think it, that you what you said really sums it up as far as how did you construct your roster if you're the type that's going to take some aces at the top of your draft and then Chris Sale becomes your SP4 or 5. That's a lot more palatable than having to rely on him as your SP2, for instance, if you waited a really long time in, in that category. So 
a lot of risk there. I liked being able to actually come full circle and actually utilize the SKU numbers and what have you. So I appreciate that, that reference point there, Ariel. All right. I think we got, we hit on some players. ATC is going to be tweaked throughout the off season. As Ariel mentioned, he's already going to be implementing some manual adjustments to certain players like Riley Green's playing times, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure that you are always updating and following him and the projection system itself has its own twitter handle now too yes it's at atc projections not as short as atc ny <laughs> but it's very descriptive so there you go and by the way craig mish is projected for 125 innings for nice the, oh now he's pitching Seattle, oh even better he, now he's pitching yeah <laughs> and he's playing out center field that's this is in the new show hey <laughs> all right kevin take if us only out, we could get Shohei out there in the yeah. outfield <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, do you have anything else to add as far as any other advice as we finish up our double digit episodes with 99 coming to a close? Yeah, just a reminder, ADP, be careful. It's not just setting the correct format, adjusting your dates to get the most recent. Click on the player, see where he's going the very most recent, just this last handful of drafts. Double check Keep in mind who's in your league. Bunch of Red Sox fans. Chris Sale's probably going earlier than in a league where we don't have Red Sox fans, or later, depending on how disgruntled of fans they are. But you would know that if you're in a league with some of those guys. Remember that, and remember, people talk about this all the time. I think Justin Mason probably brings it up the most, but that ADP is set by 14 teams that aren't winning their league. Right. 14 over 93 percent of what goes into ADP is losing fantasy baseball teams. Just remember that when you're looking at ADP. It's really morbid when you say it like that, but uh, it's true. It's actually it's fact. All right. That's going to do it. It takes time. Ariel Cohen, thank you so much for taking the time to join us on our 99th episode. Can you take a couple seconds to remind everybody where they can find your work? Anything else besides the ATC projections you have working at any of those spots and how they can follow? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at ATCNY and you can follow the ATC projections for fun stuff and some information as they come up at ATC projections. I write for fan graphs. I write for Roto baller and you can find the ATC projections up on those two sites plus CBS sports line and got a nice podcast, which just had its hundredth episode too. So I know the feeling guys, it's amazing, right? It's called beat the shift. It looks brown when you pull it up its picture. It's got a nice silhouette of a batter or a runner. And yes, I understand that there's going to be no more shift, but we are not changing the podcast name it's called beat the shift we have baseball players on we've got managers coaches i don't think we've had a manager yet we've had general managers come on we've got excellent fantasy analysts a lot of fun stuff we even had bill james on last year some good stuff you never know who's going to pop by the beat the shift podcast and we do a lot of strategy so tune in every single week, even two times a week during the the preseason. So there you go. Thanks, thanks so much for having me, guys. This was absolutely a blast. You guys are awesome. All right, I want to add one thing real quick because it didn't come up in this episode, but it does at some point. It Most of the time when you are out there speaking, anybody that wants auction draft strategy advice, Ariel's the place to go. Yeah, so I'm glad you brought it up because I wasn't going to bring it up. I was wondering about the podcast name. So I'm glad to see that's <laughs> going to that's gonna stay. And you're not going to change the graphic, not going to change the title or anything. It's still beat the shift. And the shift is still going to be a thing, whether we, it's not really banned. We've invested $20,000 in yep. RotoWare shirts. So I can't <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, guys, that is going to wrap it up for episode 99 of On The Wire. We will be back throughout the off season. Make sure to subscribe, share, and review the podcast wherever you're listening. You can follow myself on the Twitter at 80 Gray. That's all spelled out. Kevin is at Tasting Kevin. Of course, follow the pod itself at On The Wire Pod. Uh, once again, thank our guest, Ariel Cohen, for joining us. Follow him at ATCNY on the Twitter. After all that, I am Adam Howe. On behalf of Kevin Hayes, thanks for listening. We bid you goodbye.